Dr. Anna Grinneth. She's an assistant professor of biology at ISU. Dr. Grinneth earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Middlebury College, where she held her first teaching position as an undergraduate teaching assistant. She earned her MS in biology from Florida State University in 2012, where as a graduate teaching assistant, Dr. Grinneth realized she was most excited to research effective strategies for teaching and learning science. Grinneth earned a PhD in curriculum and instruction with a concentration in science education from the School of Teacher Education at Florida State University. Grinneth joined ISU in 2019 and loves exploring biology with ISU's undergraduate students in introductory biology, biology teaching methods, wonder about biology, which is a first year seminar course, and a course-based research experience in bacteriophage bioinformatics. Grinneth is heavily involved in the Doctor of Arts and Biology Education degree programs in biological sciences and offers a rotating sequence of six different graduate courses on topics in science and biology education. When she's not in the classroom, she continues to think deeply about education with the fantastic graduate and undergraduate students of her biology teaching and learning research lab. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you everybody for joining us today. I will share my screen. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, what I was gonna share today is uh, is my experiences kind of, I'm in the, just the initial stages of exploring and thinking about how to incorporate open education resources into a large introductory biology course. Um, so I'm going to share my experience from the from the fall with you today. Um, so I teach a course called Biology One, and this course can range in enrollment. Um, sometimes I have 75 students, and then most recently in the fall I had 175 students. So it's a pretty large enrollment course, and this. Biology One course is uh, part of a two course sequence. So typically introductory biology, there's one semester of biology one and then the next semester of biology two. And so that is the intro biology sequence. And typically the same textbook is used for that two course sequence because our introductory biology textbooks span all of introductory biology. So in general, the idea is that the first half of the book pertains to the biology one course, and then the second half of the book pertains to the biology two course. And that two course sequence are core courses for several majors here at ISU, biology, biochemistry, microbiology, earth and environmental systems. So there are many students in these majors that do use that same book across the two course sequence. But at the same time, biology one is also required for many other majors, but biology two is not. So there are many students that are going to enroll in biology one, but then not need to take biology two. And then also biology one does count as um, a general education objective five course. There are also students taking biology one to meet that general education objective. So there's many students enrolling in the biology one course and not all of them are going to go on to take biology two and therefore use the entire biology two textbook. And so that really got me thinking about um, how can I support our students that are taking only biology one and really only need that first half of the book. It really just, you know, I wasn't comfortable with having students buy a full book when they were only going to use half of it. And oftentimes um, these introductory biology textbooks, um, they, they, they are, they're not they're not inexpensive. They're, uh, they do tend to, to cost a bit. So that's why I wanted to explore OER options so I could provide students in my biology one course several different options of what type of textbook they could use for the course and they could pick one that, that meets their needs and kind of how they're gonna use the book. And so that's what I wanted to introduce today. And so I think thought about with um with the help of Kim Tompkinson and Ryan Randall so thank you for your help on that i explored several different options for open education biology textbooks and after looking at a few different ones and then also talking to many colleagues colleagues at other institutions it seems that what when people that teach biology 1 or biology 2 think about an open education book many are going to the OpenStax Biology 2E textbook. And so based on what 
I saw other people doing and looking at a few different things and really getting a sense that this is the most popular option for this course, um, I decided to go with the OpenStax version of, of the biology textbook. And there's a few things that's nice about the OpenStax biology textbook is that it does come in a variety of formats. And so students can use it completely online and view it online. Um, there's also an app they can download to look at the textbook. They can also download a PDF, so they have that wherever they are. Um, and then they can also order a print copy. So there's a variety of formats depending on what people's preferences are. And another thing that I think I especially wanted to highlight because I think it's really important is that um, OpenStax highlights how easily updated the the version of this book is, and, and it is the online version that's e easily updated. And so that's nice because I think it's just going to get better and better and better. Um, so I'll say more about that in a moment. So there are a couple of things about the OpenStax biology textbook. Um, it also comes with different resources for the instructor, which is really great because I know this isn't always the case um, depending on what open, open resources people use. And so the OpenStax textbook comes with a connection to the Commons Hub resources. It also has connections to um, PowerPoint slides that you can draw on for putting your class together. Um, I don't think we can see it in this screenshot, but uh, it also has um, different packages that can be uploaded right into your learning management system as well. So, and there's also a, um, a test bank of exam questions. So it does have a lot of the resources that a lot of our other um, textbooks have, which makes it a nice option as well. And so, as I said, I gave my students multiple options of books that they could pick depending on what, what their needs were. And so how I did that was on the very first page of the syllabus, I brought students' attention to it right away with this kind of box on the first page of my syllabus that says, what are we reading this semester? And I just wanted to give this image of what the first page of the syllabus looks like to, to show how I tried to bring attention right to it. But then I know there's a lot of words here. So let's just zoom into the, what are we reading this semester box? And so I set up the expectation that everybody's gonna need needed a textbook to complete assigned readings and choose one of these three options. Um, but what they choose really can depend on, they can decide on what, what cost they're comfortable with and then also what their needs and goals for taking the course are. And so the option one is that zero cost option from OpenStax. And I do emphasize in providing this option, um, after trying this a, a couple semesters and getting feedback from students, I wanted to be upfront that this is a sufficient textbook for this course, but it is not currently as high quality as um, some of the other options. And so I wanted to be upfront with students about that as they're considering which one they want to do. And um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's great that the that the OpenStax book is going to be continually updated and revised, because I think it is just going to get better and better. And hopefully at some point I can kind of take that qualification away. But it is sufficient for my course, but it's not as high quality as the other two options. And then I describe how it is available for students. And then the other option, it does qualify under the category of low cost, depending on which options student get, students get. So this is the Campbell Biology textbook um, put forth by Pearson, and they do offer a low cost option where you can access the e-text for $9.99 a month, but there's a minimum of four months. So for if we think about a semester, it ends up being about $40 for four months access. And so I highlight that low cost option and that there are though other formats available because oftentimes I get feedback from students that they do like having the, a physical a physical book to be reading and using as a reference. Um, so there are other options that they can access if they would like. And then I also include a note that if you are um, in biology one and you are planning to take biology two at ISU, that you can assume that you'll be using the same textbook. And so just knowing that you'll use the same textbook across these two courses could be informative for someone's decision that, that they decide they do want to choose option two over option one. And then the last option I provide is, um, is specifically for people taking the course because they are our teacher candidates and they are doing their degree in elementary or secondary education and planning to be science teachers, which I just want to take a short second to say 
thank you to all of our science teachers. And so for them, I offer a book that they might be interested in because I think it's a fantastic book um, that models a lot of the best practices in thinking about designing courses for biology education that I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. And so that, that's another option. And so I offer these three options right there on the first page of the syllabus, which does often bring up a lot of questions. And so I've been trying to think about and refine how I can um, make this idea that I'm offering three different books and that people can choose which one best fits their needs and interests and reasons for being in the course. I'm trying to think about how to make that most clear, but typically what I've experienced is that I do get a lot of questions from students before the start of the semester. And of course, I'm always happy to answer those. And I encourage them that um, if they're unsure which, which book might be the best fit for them, that I'm happy to give them guidance and my advice on that as well. And so part of how I do that, besides putting this in the syllabus and making sure that's posted on the Moodle page um, well before the start of the semester, is I also post uh, what I intend to be a short introductory video um, to the course, welcoming students to the course, and then also verbally describing why we have three different textbook options, that you only need to have one, and how you might go about making that choice. Um, another thing I need to work on is actually making that short, because you can see that down here in the corner it ended up being almost 20 minutes. So that's something I want to improve in the future, is perhaps making several short videos on specific topics. So instead of having one video that's the course welcome, an overview. I'll have one that maybe is titled, um, which textbook might be best for me and have that focus just on that. So it's a nice short resource to explain that. And I think that will be helpful. Okay. And then also on the Moodle page, I make sure that I've got the syllabus, that it has that language, um, the detailed topic and assigned reading schedule, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this does, I think, reassure people that no matter which textbook they pick, I'll, I'll tell them which readings are specific to that, that textbook. They won't have to figure that out or try to make, make those decisions on their own. And then I also have the course welcome and overview video there. And I use the course completion settings to indicate that I expect students to review these things pretty early on at the start of the semester there, before the semester or in that first week. So they they're know that they've got some decisions to make about which textbook to use. And then zooming in on that detailed topic schedule, this is how I um, currently have been communicating which readings for which book. So this is our first week of the semester. And um, I build this document out for all of the weeks, but just for one week, we've got the driving question that's gonna drive our learning that semester, which biology topics we're gonna learn about by exploring that driving question, and then what the assigned readings are for each of the book options. Um, and at the start of the semester, it's the same for all of them. We all start with chapter one, but then that does start to deviate. And then what the specific learning objectives are. And so again, for each week, I build that out for no matter which textbook you're using, you know, which particular chapters or chapter sections pertain to our learning for that week. And so after, trying this out in this most detailed way that I've done so far in the fall. Around week four, I surveyed students in class using the Moodle feedback option and said, okay, now that we're in week four, which of the three textbook options did you decide to use for this course? And I gave them the four different options. So the OpenStax being the open source, no cost, and then the Campbell textbook, and then the Norton textbook, or the option of I haven't used any yet. So by the fourth week of the course, 50% of students responded, um, and these are the students that were in class that day, so this is 158 students, 50% responded that they were using the OpenStax textbook, 30% were using the Campbell textbook, 17% were using the Norton textbook, and 3% hadn't used a textbook yet by week four. And so I wanted to show these because I thought people might be curious when we give options of different textbooks, what did students tend to use, at least in this semester? So that's there. Um, but I but I did also have some other thoughts I wanted to share as I got to this slide where um, in my experience, like I already suggested, I did get lots of questions from students about how to decide on which book, which 
um, I totally expected and I'm going to continue thinking about best ways to provide that guidance to help students feel confident in making that decision at the start of the semester. I also did in answering those questions when I explained that you don't have to buy a textbook for this course, that there is this OpenStax option that is completely free that did receive a lot of positive responses from students. So I think that's reflected in the um, in the data here where 50% of the students were using that that no, zero cost book. Um, but I also had situations where because I gave three options and I and I adopted those all through the bookstore. So if students went to see what books are required for this course, there were three listed. And I did make sure each one said recommended and none of them said required. And we also put a note in there that said that explained pick one of these. Um, but I completely understand that somebody might go and see, oh, these are the textbooks for this course. I should probably get all three. So I did have many students that ended up, of course, there wasn't anything to buy for the OpenStax version, but did end up buying both books. And many of those students, we did get to interact early on in the semester that they could return one of them, um, perhaps in the first week of class after I talked about it in class also. So they could end up returning one because that definitely wasn't my intention for people to, to purchase two books, um, for sure. I did also have students, though, that that said that since they knew all three were available, they actually preferred having all three. And some students that did do all three sets of readings, um, which I did talk with them about and said that, that they didn't need to do that, but that was something they wanted to do to make sure they felt like they were um, accessing all the resources they could. And then I did also have students that told me, and this was not systematic, this is more kind of anecdotal in, in conversation, but that they started with the OpenStax, but then decided that they did want to buy the Campbell textbook because um, they did want that, that um, deeper level of detail. So there was some feedback there where, where some students, and these were largely students that I, I believe were planning to then go on and take biology too as well, um, but they started with the, the no cost option and then decided they did want to, they did want to purchase the Campbell option. And then I also had some of that same feedback from some of my teacher candidates who started with the, the Norton option, but decided they also wanted the Campbell option for more detail. So, um, so I think that was really important to know and something I'll have to keep thinking about as well. Okay, and so that was what I wanted to present about the textbook, and I think I have a couple minutes left, so I did want to just share a little bit about some other open education resources that I also drew on for this course. And so I, I organized the learning in this introductory biology course around driving questions so that instead of marching through topics, each week we're exploring a different question, and through exploring that, um, we're learning some, some the essential biology topics. And so some of those driving questions I put here for us to look at, can drinking too much water be dangerous? Why is cyanide poisoning so quick and deadly? And organizing learning around these driving questions is quite aligned with recommendations for science education, both at the K-12 and in the higher education level. Um, but thinking about how to organize our learning around driving questions um, does take a lot of thinking. And so I drew on several different resources to help me think about this. And so some of those are, um, Course Source, which is specific for undergraduate biology and physics, Learn Genetics, which is, I believe, from the University of Utah about genetic science learning, Understanding Evolution, the EcoEd Digital Library is more specific for ecology resources. Mm -hmm. I've got that Norton Biology Now textbook down here because um, one of the reasons why I, I provide it as an option and specifically recommend it for teacher candidates is that the entire textbook is organized around driving questions. So I just love that. Um, there is a full biology curriculum for high school um, through the University of Colorado Boulder that's fantastic that I draw a lot of driving questions from. And then there's this great resource from AAAS, Science in the Classroom, which has a series of open access annotated research papers that are already annotated and are great for helping students learn how to, um, how to read the scientific literature and then also how to annotate that as well. And then in addition to these sources, I also draw a lot on, um, on great short videos, people that are very skilled at making short informative videos that I need to take some tips from and learn from myself. Uh, but the Crash Course Biology version has some great short videos, HHMI Biointeractive, and then YouTube Biology. And so I look over these also for, um, for nice short videos that I think explain um, topics that I know are particularly challenging in a certain week for students. So they have another resource, an open resource that they can they can draw on for um, 
for working with that content. And this was a great tip I learned by working with Kim and Ryan is that I used to um, think, oh, the more resources, the better. And so, yes, I think if I go here, I've got a couple screenshots of my Moodle page where um, I'll come back to what I learned in a second. I haven't said it yet, but for each week, I set it up on the Moodle page with what the driving question is. I have just the excerpt from that reading guide that pertains to that week. I've got the slides that we will work with in class, um, an in-class question every week, and then just one, maybe two of these, of these short videos that I've specifically picked because I've decided they're the best. And so that is what I learned is I used to think the more resources, the better. And so I'd have a big long list of resources students could use, um, but, but best practices says that that would be overwhelming. And so really I should do the, I should do the work of curating that down to just one or two really great videos. Um, Cause then th that's, that's less overwhelming. And so with that, I think I will, that's most of what I have to share. And I'm just going to end with the slide that kind of has all the open resources that, that I draw on in case anybody has specific questions about any of those. And so I'm happy to, to take any questions or explain anything further. So I have a general question. So um, you talked about how you got started, but did you find anything super overwhelming or challenging about taking on this this project um what was the biggest hurdle yeah that's a great question i think the the biggest hurdle and the thing that i really had to make sure i carved out time for was making that alignment table of which sections in the textbook i i assigned previously and then now bringing in other textbook options looking through each of those to see which which sections then I would need to assign in those books, and then also getting a sense of what was included or not included. So for example, the OpenStax book um, does tend to have a bit less detail than the Campbell book. And so I felt like I needed to be aware of what was in what, and just, again, making sure I could say the OpenStax is sufficient to use for our course, everything that we'll that we're going to learn in the course is in that book um what was what took the most time it does sound challenging so um anybody else have any questions i've got a few but i want to make sure that you guys have the option yeah and i know we talked at length before about your project and um the work that you put into it is amazing so did you happen to track how much time you spent from start to finish when you opted into being an OER stipend recipient? <laughs> That's a great question. I did not track how much time I spent. <laughs> I probably should have, but I, I didn't. Um, and I also know that I sometimes when I get into something and I'm looking at things, I know I'm not the most efficient efficient worker. <laughs> so, so the time I spent might not fully be reflected on like what was absolutely necessary because I kind of, you know, would in exploring all these resources, it's it um there's so many great things that that you can easily kind of spend more time than you had originally allocated, but you're also doing productive work. So it's kind of hard to stop. It gets exciting, doesn't it? Yeah. So did it feel like doing using an OER or OER materials and these other ancillary materials that you have, um, as opposed to if you were to, to adopt a brand new textbook from a publisher and then try to organize your course around it, do you think that there was a there would have been a time difference based on your experience previously? And was it did it take more time this way? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I I think I think I would say it probably would take less time this way. Um, and I guess I'm saying that because I already had kind of the driving questions in mind that I've been developing each time I teach the course. And as I'm trying to pick out readings that go along with those driving questions and the topics associated with them, I was doing the same thing with our with the typical textbook that we've that the department has been using of trying to figure out which you know it's it's not necessarily we start with chapter one and then go two, three, four. Um, I was already trying to pair together which which sections of the textbook would go together in that nice story. So I think um, given the approach I was taking to organizing how we were going to learn the biology topics, um, that in itself, I think, 
took time, but that wasn't necessarily related to whether I was using open resources or not. That was more trying to figure out which which materials and um, which readings bundled together nicely for that driving question. Um, but but I didn't find it too overwhelming once I knew. Okay, these are the once I knew what topics were going to be bundled with each driving question. Um, going through and any of the resources to say what what's a good thing to read right now about transport across the membrane um that was pretty straightforward that was i wouldn't i didn't find that overwhelming well that's encouraging especially for anyone who's looking at adopting oer and a little bit trepidatious yeah, <laughs> thank you yeah i think that that's good that it sounds encouraging because i think that would be my takeaway message was that um at least in introductory biology, there's so much similarity across lots of different textbooks in for in this area that um, they are kind of organized similarly. So it really wasn't too difficult to to translate what we what I was doing in the Campbell book with what I was doing in the Open Stax book. So I'm just wondering, um, did you ever get any comments? like from the publishers, did they like you sharing and dibbling and dabbling and getting using, you know, a little bit of this book and a little bit that's, did they, did they respond or did you have any comments about that from the students or anybody, other faculty? Um, yeah, I would say I, I, I didn't interact much with the, the publishers of the, the books. Um, so I don't have any comments from them. Um, and I think from the student's perspective, I didn't ask them, I guess, explicitly, but I my general impression is that kind of, um, for the most part, students figure out which book they were gonna use and then use that book. And so so they weren't translating between different books. They were, they kind of, you know, once they decided which book they wanted, they, or was gonna work for them, they were working through that one book and not jumping between this textbook and this textbook and this textbook. Of course, there was the example where some people started with OpenStax and then decided they they preferred a different one. So they might've had to make one switch. Um, and we also, um, well, yeah, so so I think there's that. And then, and then otherwise drawing from these other resources that I have listed on this slide, no matter where, you know, the, the great video was coming from or the great self-guided activity was coming from, students always linked to that via the Moodle page. And so they didn't have to find it from whatever website it was. They just knew, okay, there's going to be some additional resource that Dr. Grinna thinks will support my learning included under that day's activities. Okay. I, oh, I did have one. I remember one specific comment from the from the reviews in the fall, though, was overall students wanting more of these videos also sprinkled into our class time. Um, so my takeaway from that would be that that they did. They also found those videos informative and a, another way of accessing that information and that they they enjoyed those. That's good that they're asking for more. I, I always find that that's kind of interesting students. We have this perception that students don't want the extra stuff. Just give me the nitty gritty. But it's kind of invigorating when they do ask for more. That's that's pretty awesome. And I don't know if this is a question. I mean, this is a question for you, but it's not necessarily reflective of the change to OER. It might just be your personality and and how you interact with the students. But it sounds like they really liked the idea of the OER resources. Did they like the variety? Or um, what do you think was enticing about the OER resources? Maybe it was just the way you presented it. Hmm. Well, I, I think in terms of thinking about the book, um, students that were that knew they were taking just the biology one and not going on to the second sequence appreciated that they had an option, a zero cost option that was sufficient for being successful in in my course and didn't come along with needing to purchase purchase something that had that we already knew right up front we were only using the first half of it. So I think that I think students really appreciated that. Um, and then also, I think there is are so many so many great things that if you're like I've got some questions about this 
this topic, let's say cell division, that that as a student, I might go Google that and try to find a video that that explains it in a different way than the book or that then we did in class. Yeah. Um, but again, there's so many options that I think taking that guesswork away of me saying, you know, this one is really good. Like if you're going to watch a 10 minute video on this topic, this is the one that I recommend you go to. So I think taking some of that guesswork out of it, students appreciate it. But then also a lot of these, um, these materials here make for really great activities in the classroom. And so in my typical hour and 15 minute class, um, I will, I'm never talking the whole hour and 15 minutes. And there's always opportunities for us to be figuring something out, even if it's just a, a five minute um a five minute problem that we put up on the board and work together in groups. Um, but if you're going to take those times and take those those breaks for us to figure things out together in our lecture class, it's good for it's good that that's driven by a really good prompt and that the task itself is um, is nicely well designed, that it, it feels like it's supporting learning. Um, and so I so I feel confident drawing from these resources that someone has put a lot of time into thinking about the tasks that I pull from there. And then I think that does translate into the student experience as well, um, where they feel like, oh, okay, I'm, we're gonna take 15 minutes of class time for me to think about this, talk to the people around me, and then we're gonna unpack it. And that 15 minutes of working through it, I I hope that they feel like that is um, supporting their learning in an effective way compared to me just, just telling them what we're gonna have as the takeaway of that activity. Pretty awesome. Anybody else? I just wanted to say thank you for giving your presentation today. We were in a presentation yesterday and the presenter was saying that just implementing OER does not equate to automatic gains in learning, but because students may still choose not to read, right? <laughs> I mean, that's always something students you know, some of them do, some of them don't. But in some of the books I've been reading about teaching and learning, they do talk a lot about getting students to work together in groups and peer teaching. <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of of actual learning that takes place when that happens, because uh, you probably understand this, that uh, a new uh, person, someone new to the topic um, experiences hurdles that an expert has forgotten about right so but i think it's just really neat that you you incorporate some of those uh, learning activities into your class so thank you for presenting today thank you so much yeah and I, I, those are great points and yeah i agree completely okay i'll be signing up for a biology class from you sometime <laughs> You're welcome to. Yeah, <laughs> I think we have fun. But uh, but if you if you encounter any of my students around around campus, you can ask them for their opinion. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming.